of background. I don't know if some of you have followed the work we've been doing at the ASA on citizen science and crowdsourcing. We've deployed many different types of apps. Some of them, they were purely crowdsourcing, like um, picture pile, where we ask people, can you see something in a square? And they can just swipe. It's a swiping app. It needs seconds to make a decision. It's very efficient and fast. And to collect masses of uh, uh, reference data, or you can use it as training data, um, classified images, essentially, uh, for, for many different applications. Um, and also the GeoWiki is kind of the central piece we've been developing over 15 years, um, where we have run export campaigns. So we use this tool also for the interpretation of very high resolution images, those found on Bing, um, Google Maps, um, Google Earth, um, and also there are other archives now becoming available. Um, so with that kind of work, I'm trying to change to the next, but it's not working. Can you? Can you move to the second? Um, we basically are trying to um, now link this in situ data with the machine learning, and we've done some tests on that. Um, so um, it's OK. I can just finish the, this, and then you just take over. It's no problem. So um, essentially, we, we have been doing this with, also with GeoWiki, and we set up a specific, um, maybe you just go to the next one, because we are a bit late. <laughs> we set up a specific campaign to detect drivers of tropical deforestation in Peru. Um, because there we could do some more tests specifically with respect to country data, country data which was available in that where we can run those tests. Maybe you just click through. If my ah, yeah, now it's working. Oh, great, thank you. And this is the GeoWiki tool where you have different ways of exploring this data. Um, you you can also access this very high resolution. Um, you can then on the right hand side choose the specific appropriate driver class. You have an NDVI um, time series tool. We've heard that this is really critical. And we have um, also a visual viewer on the Sentinel Cloud Free, Cloud Free images, which gives you time, timeliness information if there has been any chases, and then you can submit. And these are the results you can then produce. Um, these, these are all points, and you can then see where the drivers are of tropical deforestation split down in nine different drivers. As you can see here, um, over South, South Africa, America, it's really a lot on pasture. Pasture is a big driver, and, but also the managed forest class and the others. With that, I hand over to, to Milutin, um, who will give you more insights on this experiment uh, we've been running. Also, um, Johannes Reiche and Robert Masole was was involved in this. Over to you, Melut, in the next the next presentation. So, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming on Citizen Science session. Uh, yeah, so uh, maybe to to just to say immediately, like uh, at the beginning, a caveat. Uh, it's like this this was really a proof of concept what we done. Uh, in this exercise, so uh, we basically uh, started uh, like a quick uh, expert uh, citizen science campaign on forest loss drivers uh, uh, to validate uh, and, and uh, uh, label rad alerts. Uh, yeah, in in Peru, uh, as you can see on my slide. Uh, so uh, what we were doing, it's, uh, it's basically we, we uh, replicate the, the campaign, uh, a colleague of mine, Dan Juan Carlos, and uh, for, the, for the whole South America. So 
but we, we changed it uh, a bit uh, in, in a way that, uh, that we only had the 1,000 geolocated and, and labeled points and uh, they were randomly distributed according to the uh, high confidence uh, RAD alerts. So a RAD, uh, about the RAD alerts, uh, uh, Robert will speak more in, in the next slide. And uh, we, we had two experts validating uh, those points and we have uh, uh, nine different categories. So those, those categories were the same categories as introduced uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this paper. Uh, so the only difference here is that due to the very limited time, we, we couldn't run the complete citizen science campaign. We just had those two experts uh, uh, validating the points. And, and then we, we wanted actually uh, uh, to make a kind of an exercise where we go uh, back to back and, uh, and, and see, uh, actually mimic our future pipeline and use this uh, meeting today to, to brainstorm and discuss about our, our future steps and, and, and actually needs uh, for citizen science data. Yeah, this, those are the class definitions. I, I wouldn't spend much time on that because it's just, there is not enough time, uh, but uh, the, you, you can read about them in, in this publication. So they are the, the, the same definitions and uh, the GeoWiki uh, interface Stefan already introduced. So maybe I, what I should mention additionally, so here in the background, we had the RAD alerts. Uh, the experts, they were looking at this uh, uh, rectangle and then they were uh, actually zooming in, zooming out, changing, uh, going back and forward and, and, and uh, uh, deciding ab about uh, one of those nine categories. They were putting some extra comments or if they were unsure, they were also able to, to skip this uh, uh, validation as well. And on the right side, you can see that they, they have access to the NDVI time series. There, there are the image time series as well. They, they, can, uh, they can take a look at. Uh, yeah, and uh, in addition to those nine labels, we also uh, validated the date of uh, uh, disturbance. And this was done with uh, uh, false color composite of the Sentinel-2 images uh, taken from Sentinel Hub. So, uh, the operators, uh, the, the, they were uh, uh, actually noting down the first, uh, the first available image with uh, uh, fully uh, with the completed deforestation uh, happened. Yeah, and uh, about the, the, the final results of this validation campaign, so it's that there is one category that was uh, uh, yeah uh, striking out. So. Uh, so it's it's this uh, um, it, it's about the uh, uh, agriculture uh, uh, driver and uh, and another interesting uh, category was the mining and of course there is a well known hotspot of uh, illegal mining in, in South Peru and and and, and actually we, we could uh, clearly see this in. in uh, during the, our validation campaign. Yeah, I will not spend, due to the time constraints, uh, I will not spend much time on this slide, but this is how the, the whole uh, uh, citizen science campaign should work. And so there are different phases. And what we done here, we uh, actually just focus on these expert control points. So usually we have people, we invite people to, to do this validation and we have experts to, to validate or, or actually to, to get uh, uh, confidence in, in, in their labels. So, so this time we, we just do this expert campaign and what we are planning to do in the future is this complete uh, set, uh, uh, set of actions that, that we will discuss later. Yeah, and yeah, with this, I would like to thank you for uh, attention and also ask Robert to, uh, to present the uh, RAD alerts. Yeah, so thank you, Martin. For, uh, so here, uh, I'm going to talk about the interlinkage between uh, assistant science, uh, LAD alert, and uh, 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 drivers. It's basically to try uh, to map drivers, but using the data uh, from citizen science as reference data uh, for this uh, activity. Uh, so, Ladder Alert, this is a product which is available, so it's kind of near real time uh, disturbance alerting systems uh, for the humid uh, forest, which is available at 10 meter uh, resolution. And uh, we have also developed like a machine learning models, so depending method for uh, tracking drivers of deforestation across the pan tropics. 
and uh, the uh, basically the drivers of this is one of the work we, we did so uh, here you can see for example we are able to assign labels so when you have deforestation being detected you can assign the label of what kind of driver is causing uh, deforestation so for example on the left you can see that uh, uh, you have like small towns so you have some buildings and over time uh, buildings increasing but also small scale agriculture increasing over time you can also see some roads coming in but also over time those roads kind of disappearing because of uh, the growth of trees and on on the right uh, you can see like uh, you have mining for example coming in initially and over time uh, the mining activity like uh, as activity like small scale crop land increasing over time so you have some kind of primarily uh, kind of driver and then which is causing other kind of drivers to to come in so with that concept we try to uh, to go ahead to 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 involve citizen science of course the problem the challenge is normally during the mapping activities of the drivers you need uh, reference data reference data and uh, how do you get reference data specifically designed for uh, machine learning or deep learning task that's a very big challenge to get such kind of data. And for example, in this figure, you can see uh, we have uh, uh, data. Yeah. Here uh, for Africa, we have kind of a lot of data. This is like, like a place we have done a lot of work. And also, you can see we have a lot of data in South America. But the challenge you can see, for example, in Southeast Asia, we have like one kind of data, like which is a dominant, uh, compared to other places. So, how do we are we able, uh, can we be able to get small data? And citizen science kind of uh, becomes as a, an opportunity to try to do that work, uh, and not only like to accumulate. So it's not only about having more data, but also the distribution of the data. So, for example, you can see some kind of data sets you see only on specific locations, and uh, they are not really available in certain areas. So, with citizen science campaigns, we can do to uh, fill that gap, and uh, that was the intention of the campaign and this experimental setup, which we really, really did. And so, uh, we did this in Peru. So, you can see, for example, we had a uh, uh, large alert of, uh, as Milton explained, and you have like country data. So, we wanted to test how good we can be able to use it in science uh, compared to the data which you have from uh, uh, country levels. So these are kind, kind of data which are validated uh, over time. And we did this by testing with the citizen science data. And here you can see, for example, like the amount of data. Of course, we have very few data for at, uh, like available for country scale, around 400. And we have a lot of data with citizen science, uh, the campaign we launched. However, the challenges, uh, as you can see uh, here, with the citizen science data, you have a kind of uh, a, bit, a bit of dominant, uh, like uh, subsistence agriculture is a dominant class as compared to here, we have kind of uh, uh, homogeneous distribution, like equal distribution of the classes. And uh, we can also see on the table, so subsistence agriculture is a lot of classes, while this at the country data, you have kind of equal distribution of the classes. And that's at an impact if you want to design kind of uh, uh, a deep learning uh, task for identifying drivers of frustration. And uh, of course, this is not because this was just a campaign trying to see how best you can go forward from just testing and trying to implement uh, an active operation of uh, so that we are able to collect data which will be useful for the deep learning task so that uh, deep learning method can be able to best use the data available for uh, uh, tracking these drivers. And uh, of course, from the test uh, experiment, you can see like uh, uh, on the accuracy uh, side that the data which uh, we had like from country, which were really validated and collected uh, better for machine learning task performed really well compared to the data we acquired from uh, citizen science. Of course, this is not like the result, uh, like a conclusive result, because this this campaign was basically to test the existing citizen science uh, process of data acquisition and what we want to, to 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 see how we can go forward and probably what we can change and improve so that we can have quality data 
uh, from citizen science, which will be useful for uh, developing deep learning model, which can be really useful for assisting uh, tracking these drivers of a large scale. So that whenever you have some kind of uh, disturbance alert, you can try to identify what kind of driver is causing that change to happen. Yeah, just the, uh, the, 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 the model, so on the test set, yeah. But just to make sure, I think probably you will mention it. The difference is also that the citizen science data, that's something we have been discussing yesterday, it's point data. While the country data is polygons, and polygons by nature, that's what you need for deep learning. So this is not a very conclusive, uh, you know, graph. This is just really like very preliminary results. So it's two types of data sets, the data format. And so we also discuss how we can move forward with actually via citizen science to to general or to collect polygon data which is required for deep learning so please don't draw any conclusions from this graph it's just like we want to test the process to also um, i'm really surprised that the export is very low for yeah but, uh, but it's point yeah. data for deep learning yeah, yeah. Yeah. area you need polygons yeah this is one thing i, I mean what i would also add uh, I, we, we were planning actually to the, to have a discussion on this slide later but basically what is here i think robert dunn he was using uh, uh, citizen science data to make a model to predict the country data, yeah, and of course it's uh, uh, it's uh, twenty percent and going down. So if if uh, if we would do other way around and you and, and train the machine learning model to mimic uh, the citizen science data, it wouldn't work as well, yeah. So that's uh, so uh, therefore in interpreting this, it's uh, it's really important to 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 know that there is really first first of all between uh, training data citizen science data and country data they don't match neither so spatially neither on on categories those those are just a, a few categories that they match and they compare and therefore uh, in order to have a kind of uh, interoperable uh, machine learning model where we can join both, there is a harmonization process we have to do with uh, country data, also with citizen science campaign to train our experts really to interpret something similar what the country is doing. Yeah. So this is of course difficult, and and, and within a few weeks, as we had uh, uh, and we wanted to show this uh, proof of concept just just to to pipe the line uh, to, to make the workflow uh, uh, working it's, it was not possible so therefore please don't uh, I, I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't take it as a, as a message about citizen science data at all it's just uh, our uh, very first results that we are sharing now uh, of course among the friends in the community that, that we trust yeah <laughs> yeah maybe, maybe just since we have this discussion now yeah. I don't want to take too much time but just maybe to add one more point I think as already said what matters we agree on that is always the definition that we really go back you know how what what are actually the, the is it the same definition where does it vary and also what information is coming from the country data is that really collected on the ground or is that also visual interpretation so this kind of these things are really really important because from a as we know when you look at things remotely and you're not on the ground you just cannot see certain things you can make some best guesses and assumptions and that's what it will always be when you do visual interpretation of very high resolution whatever data you have around so if you know the very high resolution is not really exactly corresponding to the date you're looking at you might just not have enough information to make this conclusion and then you have to get that information from sentinel which is a very different resolution to a 50 centimeter very high resolution. This makes makes the difference potentially also. So we need this additional work to really dig. So I think the next step would really be to do the citizen science on the same locations yeah. where we have the location, because then we can directly compare. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. Sorry, uh, Peter, you, you had uh, so just a short question, please. And then we have to move. We have another uh, presenter. Well, maybe a short question and remark on, on top of what uh, Steffen said. I think what, what we need to, to take into account is that 
we cannot always expect things to make one match 100% in space in time mathematically. So what it will be important is that we uh, uh, put to this uh, uh, data the uncertainty we have and that we, that we collect them in a scheme in which we can express that by, by in, in terms of, for example, think of, of the thematic layer going to a higher level. So if you're not sure is it this or that, there should be something coarser, more generic where you say at least it's that and not that because then in, in case of doubt you can at least use let's say the the, the, the more rougher the more coarser information be it in space time it's applicable to all the dimensions and you you don't lose the point completely and that is something i would i would systematically put into the into into all the categories in all the discretizations in which you in which you sample things also through citizen science that that will make it easier for the users and it will will, will make it easier for you not uh, to basically take uh, uh, get some use of the data in any case then. So what you're saying is to have some kind of hierarchy. Yes, a hierarchy to classification yes. system. That's, that's the point. Yeah. So that, that if you don't know whether it's a forest or, or a, 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 a more chart, then you can at least say it's, it's trees, mm. for example. Yeah, and I think the important thing is to have like kind of a discussion to uh, how best you can go forward because uh, we're planning to best uh, be able to use the data. I think it's a very uh, useful uh, task to do uh, and uh, being able to launch a, a perfect good campaign, I think that will be the, the best way forward. Yeah. So like if you have an idea, I think that will be really useful. Yeah, thanks. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, so we have another presenter online, uh, Mate from Synergize. So let's see, uh, let's test if, uh, if Zoom links are working. Always challenge. <laughs> Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah. You have yeah. to stop sh sharing uh, and possibly turn off your mics because I have a terrible echo. Please. I, I can't share uh, while the other participant is sharing, sorry. So um, meeting Eurak room has to stop sharing. Okay, one second. Okay, slideshow, show start. I will just go ahead and hope you can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and be fast. Um, we have plenty to discuss and a little time. Uh, so I will be talking today a little bit about the importance of ground truth from the perspective of uh, crop classification. So um, we've heard a lot about scales already. Um, but just a quick overview when we're talking about uh, what crops are we looking at, that is a very trivial question for a farmer who actually puts the seeds to the ground. Um, it's also fairly simple um, for somebody who is there on the ground looking what it is, although they might not know specific variety, they can say whether it's a wheat or corn probably. Um, it becomes very challenging um, as soon as you start looking uh, at the crops or the ground from far away. And far away, we've heard today, might be spatial and might be temporal. So it's both things that are challenging. And as Stefan mentioned, uh, when you start dealing with uh, remote sensing data, uh, like uh, Copernicus missions, uh, the, the resolution is significantly different. So it's really, really challenging when you start looking at it from the satellite's perspective. Uh, when we talk about satellites, um, just quickly, yeah, uh, Sentinel Hub was mentioned. So it's how we get access to the, the data and by we, I mean, synergize uh, obviously GeoWiki as well and some others. Um, I hope it, stre it streamlines the process. So it, it should deal with the challenges that are um, typically having uh, with accessing the data. But of course the point is to get from the data itself to the information. And uh, we've heard before, uh, Milutin said that um, you can visualize the time series. Of course, 
when we see when we look at the, some specific observation from Sentinel two, it's really really difficult to um, to say anything about what is growing there. But as soon as you start looking at the time series, that might be some tidbits of information uh, that you can construct or reconstruct from the time series itself. So, for instance, in this case, when we're talking about area monitoring services by Synergize, um, we can do stuff like uh, specify the crop, uh, uh, the crop that is being grown. Uh, we can visualize and see some things that are happening, like whether it was irrigated, or when it was mowed, uh, and Finally, because area monitoring is quite important in the concept of uh, common agricultural policy, so whether the, the field complies with the regulations or not. Um, so when we talk about crop identification as um, something we discern from, from time series, it's basically a time multi multivariate time series classification. Um, uh, speaking about models for a little bit more technical people, we are using bidirectional uh, long short-term memory deep learning model and where the output um, of the model is a score for each class that we're classifying. So uh, for a specific field, the, um, using its time series, um, time series from not just NDVI, but all data, let's say, uh, all bands, uh, we can then output a score, whether this is a vineyard with such a score or is it grass or something else. Now, Satellite data has issues um, in terms of uh, temporal classification. Uh, we are dealing with unevenly spaced time series. So the cadence for Sentinel-2 is three to five days, but you know how it is. Um, you have uh, bad signal values in there. Might be clouds, cloud shadows, or some other shadows, like topographical shadows, snow uh, during the winter months, and so on. Um, so those things together with registration errors between the consequent um, sentinel observations or satellite data observations are basically noise in your input data. But we kind of have some solutions for those things. So um, for regarding the unevenly spaced time series, when we're talking about LSTM models, we basically can sample a specific number of uh, temporal features. You can pad the data um, and use this as an input. The LSTM model itself is also quite capable and typically learns how to deal with uh, outliers like uh, um, clouds and cloud shadows. When we're talking about co-registration errors, um, that is particularly tricky for very small parcels. Um, and yeah, solution in quote is that um, we do not look at parcels, at, uh, at agricultural fields that are smaller than given threshold size, uh, because what we would then be looking at is neighboring fields, neighboring data, and so on. Now, when we start talking about, and we are here about, um, we are here to talk about uh, ground truth data, um, there are a lot of other issues. So in, in our, um, in our work, we rely a lot on this geospatial aid application, GSAA data, um, which is um, data that represents basically quite a highly valuable resource. Um, the GSAA data refers to annual crop declarations um, by European farmers in the uh, concept of common agricultural policy. Um, and those data have errors. Just as simple as that. They have mistakes in geometries. They have they, the the data itself contains um, uh, wrong claims. Like say I don't know. Um, um, just by pressing a, a different button, you can claim to have winter crops, uh, but you basically there are summer crops. Uh, something like that. Um, might be that the field itself is not properly separated. So um, your the farmer is claiming. Uh, one crop while there are several um, crops growing on, on particular agricultural fields. Um, next point of um, ground truth that we are using and we will be using in, in Open EMC uh, project is the Eurocrops data set. We've heard about harmonization. So this one is harmonized GSAA data from publicly available data over uh, Europe. Um, so it carries all the issues that I've mentioned before, um, but has additional ones. I mean, we've heard before already 
about unbal unbalanced data set. And we see that the distribution, for instance, of um, number of fields that cover uh, that are pasture, meadow, and grassland is significantly higher than uh, something like sugar beet. So those are kind of things that has to be have to be taken into account. And now one very good thing uh, and goes in ties with what Peter, I believe, said before, uh, hierarchical approach. So the, the Eurocrops data set um, actually contains the so-called hierarchical crop and agriculture taxonomy. So it's precisely what, uh, what was mentioned instead of saying, okay, if I cannot say which specific oats they are, there are oats or there are orchards uh, or there are nuts or you know, hierarchical representation of the data. Now, implications of the label noise on the sales, uh, on the results of the classification themselves. So first of all, we've realized that training data set just simply needs cleaning. So we have some tools and some approaches how we can deal with that, um, finding outliers and removing them from the training data set. Now, as grand truth data actually contains errors, um, we have to be aware that a perfect model even a perfect model would never have a perfect validation method. So every time we're talking about any kind of metrics from, um, uh, from machine learning experiments, we have to understand what the metrics are actually telling us. Um, for instance, perfect validation metrics might just be a sign that we have completely overfitted our model to the training data set. Um, so results really cannot be trusted blindly and additional validation needs to be performed. And this comes to my final remarks. Um, best data set that is collected um, is the one that is collected independently. So not relying on what Marker has said. Um, I do come from a country where there might be even some farmers um, uh, willing, uh, knowingly uh, claiming something else. Um, there, there are, of course, countries in Europe where this is not happening. Um, we would want the, the data sets to be collected from close up. Um, as Stefan mentioned, ground truth data really collected on the ground um, and at the specific point um, in time and place. And one final remark, training data set has to be a distinct um, training set different from the test or validation data set. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mate. Uh, yeah, so we still have uh, five minutes for a discussion. Yeah, please, Tom. A question for Mate, if you can hear me. Mate, can you hear me? Yeah, yes. The question is, do you, do you have some um, already results of the accuracy for different classes? And do um, you have some, do you have uh, for the probabilities, because you predict also fractions, right, I see. Did you, did you try also calculating like a log loss or measures of the accuracy of the fractions? So two questions, if you have accuracy already some results and second, if you do uh, fractions, you may have the fractions, for example, vineyards or something. And then uh, what is the accuracy for that fractions? So let me try to answer. Uh, first of all, we have uh, results based on you know um, areas or countries where we do uh, common agricultural com cap uh, regulations um, with uh, paying agencies. So, for instance, for Slovenia, we have a lot of um, a lot of results. Um, they are not. Um, some of them are you know publicly available, and some are not. Uh, so I cannot say a lot about that, those things. But regarding the um, the accuracy, there is in in Slovenia, in CAP, for instance, the paying agency is not really peculiar about the uh, crop uh, types specifically, but they want to know crop groups. So crop groups are sort of a hierarchical overview over what, what crop types there are. And uh, what we have learned, the best approach for that is actually trying to predict crop types and then later on group them together. So we don't do fractionalized, um, we don't do fractions. Um, you just give for each field a score, which is kind of a pseudo probability that that, um, that, that field is, I don't know, 
um, wheat or corn or alfalfa or whatnot, but in terms of crop groups. So it, there's no basically fractions, it's a pseudo probability. So we report this pseudo probability um, because when experts uh, from CAP domain are looking at the results, um, they can see, so if the pseudo probability for the two classes are very similar, the softmax would still pick up the just the one that has the, the, the largest pseudo probability, but it might be that you know they are very close apart, uh, and the expert actually can then tip the, the point saying, okay, this is probably where the model was wrong. I hope that kind of answers your questions, Tom. Yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, is it okay we continue a few more minutes with the discussion or we have to finish sharp? Yeah, maybe there are more questions. Any more? Well, yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, just a question more related to the project. Uh, is this this uh, Euro crop and this, this what you what what, um, what what has been shown as the last example is part of the of the data sets that will be uh, that, are, that were proposed? Because I think I can see in the in the survey you can see the one of the first session, but I think I cannot find this one. Uh, and then as a, so as a more general comment, uh, uh, I, I think in the, in the next, uh, in the near future, we will have to uh, agree a bit and more up to, to, to go bomb faster on this uh, work package for not only for citizen, for citizen science, but in general. Uh, so I would take also the advantage of this to give this message <laughs> to the work package then. Thank you. Part of the question was for you. Um, so regarding the Eurocrops, um, Eurocrops data set is not um, done um, by the uh, by the project. Um, so it's uh, it's work that started by Maya Schneider from Technical University of München. München. Um, but we are and have defined this as a as a data set that we will be using in the. The, in our use case, so crop uh, crop identification, um, and we've actually just recently published a blog post uh, about that. Um, the blog post pre presents some results, uh, some challenges dealing with the Euro crops data set as well, and mentions the project itself. So that that part of the question was for me, and the other one is probably for somebody else. Uh, maybe just to understand it a bit more, so you're saying that currently the Eurocrops is not listed in our sheet, so this would be an easy fix because Eurocrops is actually freely openly available, um, so it would just be a matter of adding it to our sheet because we've done this questionnaire and that, since you're using it in the project, it would make a lot of sense you add it to the work package for list Excel sheet of, of data sets, in situ data sets and others being used. We call it in situ still, um, Peter, but um, there's a lot of discussion about in situ. Um, okay, uh, other questions? I think you had another question. Uh, Matej, question about this um, European crop map from 2018 made by uh, GRC. Uh, is that a good reference? Do you use it for your work? We, we don't use it. Um, so uh, I I cannot say whether it's a good reference or not. Um, it's a what 20, I will say. It's a 20 meter, I think, resolution. It's a so Sentinel-2 based, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So so what our plans are is actually uh, uh, in, in, in the project is a multi-step uh, approach, right? First things, first thing what we will do is we will delineate agricultural fields from all the Europe. And then we will do crop classification on the fields themselves, so using time series, um, which should result in a nicer visualization at least because it will be field-based. Um, now, 
using results from some different model, of course, you can be just at least, I mean, the most as good as the that model is. Um, and regardless what reference data sets, what, what data we use as a reference, we always go through, through this first step of, of cleaning it up. So you take, you take what was suggested by the reference data, whether it's Euro crops, whether it's by claims by the farmer or even manually labeled data or whatnot. And you have a look at the time series and you compare it, let's say to similar fields in a vicinity. And if, if there are all of them similar, if they have all, all of them similar time, uh, time series data, I don't know, NDVI for instance, that's a high indicator indicator that those labels, if they're all the same, that they actually are the same. But if you have time series of for one field that is significantly different than the other, and that one is probably an outlier. So that's that's kind of a, um, a really baseline um, task that we do before we uh, before we even start training data. It's this data cleaning, right? Um, and um, yeah, that's how we would approach regardless of which data we would use. Either it would be JRC, crop map, or or uh, Euro crops data set or whatnot. Minute, but uh, yeah, if there is one urgent question, please go ahead. Otherwise, we can also close it now as well. Okay, so I guess that's not the case. So thank you very much for uh, participating this session, and uh, yeah, so enjoy the rest of the program today. And thank you for having me. Bye.